it's time for the professors and Marianne. Uh, and uh, this is the last segment of the night. And then I just need to take a long shower because I'm uh, out of my mind. Uh, Professor Bick, okay, I don't know if I'm Professor. I'm just going to invite Professor Lee here. I, she said, I, I hate to be a pig, but I'm just going to. If you choose to join us, Professor Lee, you're more than welcome. Uh, uh, I, I hate to be, uh, but I can't help myself. Prof let's start with uh, uh, Professor Cummings. I'll, I'll tell you what I, uh, well, I'm, I, I will start with Professor Bick. Uh, Corey Brettschneider, whenever he comes on the show, you know, he wrote an amicus brief. There's Professor Lee. Hi, thank you. Uh, don't mean to be pushy, but it is the way of me. Uh, you know, Professor uh, 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 Corey Brettschneider wrote all these amicus briefs uh, about the Muslim ban and uh, and every court case went for Trump. And uh, I'm going to uh, say to Professor Marianne Cummings, you were uh, photographed with uh, Nina Turner. And uh, uh, yes, uh, and Danny Glover from San Francisco I mean, just showed up to the Akron uh, Nina Turner campaign office. On, so what did you do wrong? What did you say, Professor? You were in Akron on Monday. You were going door to yeah, door. Yeah, I was there. I was there. I arrived on Sunday, uh, canvassed all Monday and all Tuesday. I was at uh, the polling station. So what did you saw in the chat room said you're, you're precinct one. So what happened? No, what happened was the, the whole county won. That precinct and the whole county went for Nina by 56 votes. And uh, I'm going to uh, claim credit for every single one of those votes. No, I really talked to a lot of people. I got them to, I, I like doing this kind of thing. I like interacting with people. I, I think I saw a little bit of your uh, segment with with Alan and Harvey, and and you're absolutely right about some people on the left and politics. You absolutely have to connect to people. That's what's so great about running for local office, because you know you either they they either vote for you or they don't, and a lot of it is if they like you. And a lot of that is if you bother to like them. I mean, you listen to them, you can like them. Even people that you didn't think you would like. And so got a I, sense mean, I, that Bernie, I, I would watch Bernie and you got a sense that he genuinely liked people as cranky as he was. And he could talk to anybody and people weren't, you know, as Hillary Clinton would regard, the people to him weren't a basket full of deplorables. There were human beings, many of whom may be misguided, a lot of them suffering, most of them suffering. And some of them being vulnerable then because of their suffering and feelings of loss and, disor and disorientation and all this are vulnerable to these blandishments of, of like proto-fascists or groups that just, you know, want to build up on resentment politics. And by the way, that is just, that's not only on the right exclusively, but, you know, when people do get, uh, when people feel threatened, they tend to get tribal. But anyway. Um, Which, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem no. with our side getting tribal and, and demonizing the richest 1% and their kids. Yeah, uh, that's well, awesome. the tribal awesome. And we should always be doing that. We should always be looking up. <laughs> and... And most of those guys, though, more of those guys identify as Democrats than Republicans, but it, you know, it hardly matters. Look, um, I fortunately for myself, um, I was not as traumatized on election night as most of the people there were, because I was just, you know, I, I was still wondering about Nina Turner, you know, because I was wondering as I was, no, I'm totally committed to getting her elected because I wanted to see this experiment play out. Would she be a leader? Would she be the galvanizing thing? 
that would turn the squad into a real oppositional section within the Democratic Party. But then a part of me was thinking, God, how am I going to feel when she's out, when she votes for Nancy Pelosi for speaker? And how am I going to feel when she's out there campaigning for like Tom Watt, 2024? You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of contradictions. And I, and I think part of the problem with Nina, the, the other thing that I, I told myself is, look, if Nina Turner cannot navigate her own part of the woods, if she didn't understand what MFers, you know, the party regulars were going to be, if she couldn't imagine what they could do to her, then how is she going to like navigate the vicissitudes of Washington, D.C.? I mean, she didn't know. I mean, they knew. I mean, you have to get out in front and you know these people are going to throw everything they can at you. You have to at least point out real things about them. <laughs> With Chantel Brown's, you know, sort of funneling millions of dollars. What was the debate like between Chantel Brown and yeah. Nate Turner? What was that like? I mean, you had the Cleveland Plain Dealer supporting Nina Turner. So I, I would assume the debate. I didn't see the debate. I would assume. No, I didn't see the debate either. OK, so where I was at was in Akron, Ohio. It was in Cleveland, Ohio. She won Akron, Ohio area. And she they, they think I think they too late decided to focus on Akron, Ohio, because, my God, it's there is a there is a university there. I was in a funky part of town that was a university, but nice and lots of restaurants. But there is also just tons and tons of working class neighborhoods there. And for Burgess sent me an article from Jacobin. He didn't write it, but he's saying this is uh, Jacobin just came out with an article saying that she did better with the black working class than Bernie did. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, way better. And I so think what does that, that say? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but I, but I think that uh, the fact that I was look, you know, they did not have a strong ground game. And this is, I'm talking as somebody who's been doing this since my father ran for township supervisor when I was six years old. I've been going door to door, following people going door to door. I know how to persuade people. And the fact was, they didn't have, even on election day, they didn't have everybody, at, at their, they didn't have a person at every precinct. I probably turned 20 to 30 people because believe it or not, people are who vote are in the habit of voting. And many people came there, not even decided who they were going to vote for. And it's like, if you had somebody stationed who was as committed as I was to persuading people to vote for Nina, you know, she would have found those, you know, few thousand extra votes. What I'm saying is, is that, okay, this is the reason why I'm not so traumatized. She's a fantastic, she articulates in a fantastic manner. But I think there is a bubble, even among progressives. If you are, you know, she needed to be in these neighborhoods as much as in Cleveland. And, you know, maybe she should have gone on a march for Medicare for all and organized it in those neighborhoods and not have the out of town celebrities come, but just, you know, be there with people and give one of her fiery speeches. It would have been a news event that day. Um, so I guess that the, the bottom line is too, if, if a party so despises you that they would pull the kind of dirty tricks that they did, they got Republicans. That was the scuttlebutt I was hearing too, that Republicans were coming out and voting in this primary for her opponent. Um, maybe you don't want to grind, you know, your energy and efforts to dust in this party. I mean, there's a problem. I, the problem is, is that progressives, when they try to run as Democrats, they are inherently weak because they're straddling, not because they're weak people, but, you know, in martial art or anything like that, if you are, are if you're a straddling untenable positions, you are that is a weak position to fight from. I you know, John Kerry did the same thing in 2004. They told the reporters lobbed him a softball question about if you know now, then what you know now, 
about weapons of mass destruction, destruction, would you still vote for the Iraq war authorization? And he said, I would vote the same way, blah, blah, blah. I can't even Knowing, yeah, yeah. But the but, thing is, is that he was, a, he has a lot of qualities, but he, he just reassured a bunch of Bush supporters. He's straddling a position. He's trying to knock Bush down because of this illegal war. Yet he wants, so I feel a lot of the firebrand uh, progressives they're trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to hold on to their and fight for their causes while being a good party member, meaning you'll have to support Nancy Pelosi or Kamala Harris should she run. And these people are your enemies as much as in terms of what you want done. I mean, in terms of single payer, green new deal. But, but these guys work for the same people. But Professor Marianne, unlike the the John Kerry example, who's yeah. not going to get any Republicans to vote for him. Nina Turner needed those centrist Democrats to vote for her. Even if she if she ran as a Green Party member, she'd have gotten four percent instead of forty five. I mean, it's a different it's a different situation. You can't just burn that centrist element down because they're a huge block of the voting population. Well, I think the element that voted for her opponent were was the suburbs, was affluent people. She didn't reach out. So when you talk about talk about centrist too, that's a that gets a little confusing because people may not be great on a lot of social issues. They're they don't go on, they don't have intersectionality or critical race theory in their vocabulary. But they want good paying jobs. Yeah. They would definitely want a, a, a single payer type or a national health care system where they never had to worry about going to a doctor. I mean, there are all these things, jobs, Green New Deal type jobs. You know, the, she needed she needed to be in Akron and some of the more and she needed to be in Akron earlier. But what I'm saying is that more generally, if she couldn't figure that out. In, in, in a simpler in area, which is her own backyard, to be able to navigate that, how would they do? How would she do in Congress? So that's, anyway, that, that's my wrap up of, you know, what I did this past week. Is there something, oh, go ahead, uh, uh, Professor Bick, Lee, Hussein, what are your thoughts on all this, please? Well, as Saul uh, points out in the in the chat, it's, uh, we're talking about eighteen percent turnout, which um, is very low. Uh, I mean, you know, it's about in line with these kind these type of elections, and you know, special elections where uh, you know other people are not on the ballot, and it's a primary election, uh, but it's appalling nonetheless. So. Well, it's you know, Democrats. You basically have Democrats voting. Yeah. Well, apparently, it, you know, this is another issue that, that I have trouble with. Um, states that allow crossover voting. I think that people who join a political party have the right to determine who the candidates are going to be for their party. It should not be determined by the opposition, who, who your candidates are going to be in the general election. I think that's insane. Well, I have a little pushback there. When I was uh, here in this area as a graduate student, friends of mine would often pull Republican ballots in the Republican primary because there were no, there was no ch chance of a Democrat winning or the occasional Democrat that would one run up here was just awful. So there would always be, you know, the choice between a moderate Republican that was probably pro-choice. We had them back in the 80s versus some bad crap, crazy Republican who wanted at least to be represented by a semi-reasonable person. So that's kind of a pushback. And in this right. case, um, you know, I was hoping that one of their nasty, dirty tricks would have backfired because they, they claimed there was flyers and, and uh, on-air advertisement claiming that Nina was pro-Trump. So I ran into a couple. I was Their daughter was listed who was Democrat, but these were a couple of Trump supporters. And uh, they were going to vote for Nina because she was pro-Trump. 
And I had to sit there and go, well, not exactly, but she's definitely anti-democratic establishment. That's interesting. And so they're not going to, a Republican isn't going to win. So you guys have a choice. You might as well vote for the anti-democratic establishment person rather than the very pro-democratic establishment person. Anyway, that's... I, I, you know, I would- I, I would say that the, the problem you're highlighting there is uh, one of a lack of competition. So, uh, it, you know, if you do not have elections where there are uh, where there is real competition, uh, that is one party, uh, you know, is only it only has a chance of being elected because of the way the, uh, the electoral system is structured. And because we have a two party system, I would say that is the issue rather than allowing right people of another party to vote for who's going to represent uh, the members of, of the other party. So I, it just doesn't make sense. You know, the political party should be able to determine who is going to represent them without inviting in people who are deliberately trying, trying to cause havoc, which is many times oh. the case. Um, so I understand what your argument is there. And in that case, yes. But why are we in that situation to begin with? Because Jerry that- Mandrake, that's a, this is an extremely safe district for Democrats. And these extremely safe districts for any party tend to elect the worst. Because, you know, the money then can, can kind of buy it. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Why is it that they tend to? Well, I mean, if you, you notice that the very the, some of the very safest democratic, highly democratic districts will produce, you know, just wretched right wing Democrats. Maloney, Schiff, Prashnamurti up in the eighth of the uh, congressional yeah. district here in the eleventh, very safe. Bill Foster, Blue Dog, New Dem. Right. So why is that? Well, because they, you know, they feel that they don't have to like it just it, it just as Lawrence O'Donnell has said, we never have to listen to the left. We and we always vote. I mean, we, not myself, but when even progressives proclaim that they're going to support Joe Biden or whoever, and that's it. They've given up all their power. There's no reason why the establishment ever has to listen to the left, ever. You have to be willing openly to to withhold your vote. That's the only, it's power. It's the only thing they understand. But, you know, that's more generic. I think in this case, so, um, you know, the the Democratic Party, they they just basically decided they were worried enough about Nina Turner coming to Congress that they had to send their big guns down and they had to you know, make sure they had to block her. Now, she lost, it was, I don't know, uh, I think 60,000 people, it was 70,000 people came out and voted, and she lost by about 4,000. That's not insurmountable. Right. It's not a blowout. But, as I said, I mean, I stood with, I were going to run in the head district, and I was a whole profile person, I'd be sitting there, like, you know, with my, with my most insane Game of Thrones friends, you know, trying to strategize. How would you kill me if, you know, you were the opposition? I'd be thinking about this. Well, let you me know? ask you a, a bigger question. Uh-oh. Uh, they do allow, I, I didn't know this, in the 11th district, you can have Republicans vote in the Democratic I, mean, I believe they, it, it's, a, it's a statewide thing, and I believe they have open primaries. So you, can you, you have vote? To, like, in the re- you have to when you go to the polling place, you have a Democratic district, a Democratic ballot or Republican ballot, sometimes a nonpartisan ballot if there's just, you know, uh, if, if there's just ballot initiatives. And that's true in, in, in Michigan. That's, true. that's very common in the Midwest. OK, so if you're uh-huh. a Republican trying to sabotage the Democratic Party in the 11th district, who are you going to vote for, Brown or Turner? If you're trying to sabotage the general, oh, oh, it it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to, you know, a, a Republican is not going to be is not going to be elected. I think 
it was the case that this uh, Israeli pact. There's a there's. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. We we've covered that in a second. But okay, here, but what I'm saying that that that's basically there's a lot of. Uh, uh, Jewish persons, particularly in the upscale neighborhoods, and that it's was the largest the Jewish city. population in yeah. Ohio, and I think one of the largest African American population. Here, here's my question: Is it is it safe to say that this was a Democratic primary? That Nina Turner was running for the Democratic Party nomination in Ohio eleventh, yeah. and that the people who turned out on Tuesday were Democrats. The Democrats were, yeah. for the most part, is it fair to say 99% of the people who voted in that primary were Democrats? There might have been slightly less than 99%. The others, There's a lot of people who just don't even say one way or the other. Right. So she had to win over the Democratic Party. She but, had to energize her natural base. And I did not see that in the area that I was, you know, like when we were having our council, they, they all were meeting. I didn't go up to the big party in Cleveland. I stayed in Akron and um, just down the block where I was staying. And they, they were a lot of the uh, campaigners there. And a guy comes up who was recognized by one of the local organizers going, oh, yeah, Nina, Nina. Hey, when's that election? And right. it's like, well, so, we and so th th this is what we're promised. And this yeah. is what I'm not seeing. I wanted Nina Turner to win and I wanted Bernie to win. And I've been told that when you go to the, the people and you spell out this platform, this righteous platform, you will win by a landslide that if you can get the message out, yep. you will win by a landslide. Uh, Bernie, again, you know, the, it, there were too many people on that debate stage, but mm -hmm. everybody knew who Bernie was and he did get the message out. That landslide, I don't think, no matter how much fixing the Clinton wing did with Clyburn and Buddha Judge and all that garbage, that landslide, that that natural landslide that we just automatically assume you're that 99 percent of the voters are going to respond to this. It didn't materialize. Where is it? Is it well, misreading? Are, are we misreading the voters in South Carolina in exit polling were for Medicare for all? Even as even as um, uh, Biden frowns Bernie in that state. OK, and so are we missing something? Is yeah, I think we're, we're missing a lot. Medicare for all as a coastal. I wish I were an elitist. I wish I. But uh, listen to me, people, you need. I'm coming down from the mountain to tell you, Rubes, that you need Medicare for all. That's the answer to all your problems. Medicare when you so. What if Medicare for all is something we think the American people need, but they they don't? That it's not there. Even if they're for Medicare for all, it's not their overriding concern. What if the American people don't see what we see, Professor? Well, Sager. Yeah, Medicare I mean, for I think, all, jobs, debt cancellation. I think we are. I think that we are about ninety percent of what concerns people who are struggling. Housing now. Professor Hussein. I, I think we are missing something. I mean, we have to uh, acknowledge that just uh, making the case on the issues clearly isn't enough, even though polling suggests that people support these issues. Some other dynamic is at work. And what Marianne mentioned in terms of many people identifying Nina Turner as being pro-Trump because she's so anti-Democratic Party establishment and has critiqued it, and they've been able to take public comments that she's made criticizing, um, you know, 
Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden and, and these sorts of things, being able to funnel that into the identitarian, polemical, factional logics of our political culture and process now, which is that people are behaving not on the basis of ideology. Mm -hmm. um, they are voting on some kind of sense of as if this is team sports where their identity is bound up with being a Democrat, which is why I don't have any problem with, I don't think you should have uh, open primaries. If you want to, you know, vote in that primary, register in that party. And so what if you register as a Republican or a Democrat, even though you hold all kinds of positions that are not traditionally part of it, if that's the political game and the political sphere that you're having to deal with, you adjust and you deal with that. People act as if I can't register as a Republican because I am a Democrat. Well, what good does it mean to you to be a Democrat? This shouldn't just be a factional you know, affiliation, but that's how we are behaving. And so people in this context seem to be very cautious. They're uh, anti-Trump. And so, you know, if somebody has questioned the Democratic Party, they're, they're more committed in some ways to that identification and their trust of that leadership as at least keeping out the Trumps. Um, and partly because I don't think they have any faith and belief that even if you vote for these people, even if you vote for the issues that you want, that that's necessarily going to lead to you receiving those policies. I mean, experience shows that that hasn't been the case. So it is turned from being uh, a question of discussing, debating, and making your choice on the issues as an ideological position and question into this kind of partisan, who are you with? Who's your team? Who do you affiliate with? And I think that's really sad. And that's why I think Bob Henley uh, was a guest on the show. I didn't get to hear Henry's right. um, interview with him, but I've read a little bit and his new book, Stuck, uh, really captures what I think the sclerotic paralysis of our political system um, is portrayed in exactly these kinds of voting patterns. So I would say you have to take the message that's popular to the people, but you also have to respect the fact that in a primary, you're going to have partisan Democratic voters um, who affiliate with that party, and you have to appeal to them if you want to uh, you know, have those votes and win the Democratic primary. Now, if Nina Turner doesn't want to do that and can't figure out a way to do that, then run as an independent and just do it on the issues. I mean, you know, there are choices and there are options, but I think we have to recognize that there is some strategy involved that isn't just about the issues. Unfortunately, it should be. It should be. We should educate people to vote on the issues, but clearly they're not doing that. Well, yeah, I, I don't think she excuse she me for one second. people and, into and, cold and, like and, Hang on, I just want to circle back to something Professor Hussein said, because it's very important about identitarian politics. What you have is we talk about the African-American vote and the woman, the female vote. There are people and I'm not as much. There was a time in my life where my identity was I'm a Democrat. Like I, you know, uh, my, I say to my kids, you bring a republic. Now, this is stupid talk. But, you know, when Obama was president, I'm not proud of this, but I used to say to my kids, uh, you bring a Republican home. If you date a Republican, uh, I'll disown you. Uh, I was half joking, but I half meant it because that was my identity when Obama was president. Not smart and not completely. Um, I meant it. I meant 50 percent of it, but that was part of my identity. And I think uh, the left doesn't uh, respect the, the identity of people who identify as Democrats. Professor Lee? Oh, I, I agree with you. The problem is uh, questions of um, what counts as party loyalty. 
I mean, I, I think in larger, more concentrated urban areas, you do have this identification with party. But you could say that it is a kind of sprawl politics. And, and in fact, even this particular election had sprawl politics. At least the preliminary data shows that the suburbs were what Brown won. And then it was kind of a, a wash uh, relative to, you know, Turner did get a lot of votes, actually. I, I think it was a reasonably good showing. The problem, of course, was that she was far ahead in the beginning. And then this cascade of money came in towards the end. Yeah. But what and the there is the issue uh, that she didn't vote for. I don't think she voted for Hillary in 2016. Is that correct? I don't think she told people she wouldn't tell people exactly who she voted for. And so if you're trying to win the Democrat again, I'm I was for her. Mm -hmm. I'm really mad that she didn't win. I'm just looking for accountability and the, the left. Uh, is this an example of a purity test on the left that has come back to bite us on the ass? The idea of she yeah, was yeah. It, I'm sorry, Professor Lee. Well, yeah, in a sort of meta way, I think that that some of the negative and I don't know this for sure, but it, it seems to me, at least in the social media, they still go back to her 2016 vote as a negative for Turner. And, I, you know, that's just absurd. I mean, you know, how how many years are we further along and what are the real issues? But the fact is that meme has still persisted. And. If you're running for the Democratic nomination and you didn't vote for Hillary in 2016, that's a fissure that suggests a lot. I mean, it it it, it is telling if you didn't vote for Hillary in 2016. It's telling. It yeah, is. I, I think I think we're we're not thinking stupid enough here in terms of election. On my show? Are you? Yeah. Kidding? Way too much analysis. I think imagine the bump that Chantel got having the name of the football team. That's huge. Not only that, what if Nina got Tina Turner endorsement? That might have worked. Of the Guardians or something. Nina Seriously. Guardian. Nina Guardian. I think. A lot more stupidity has to be brought to the fore to win election. <laughs> and she could have, if she changed it to Tina, then her slogan could be, I like Ike. So uh, can I come on on three yeah, points please. that have been raised? <laughs> yes, so, please. Three, three important points have been raised. Uh, um, one was uh, by the Professor football Trump. team. That's one. Yeah, that was yeah. number, number one, two, and three. Um, no, but you're right. Uh, but let me start with uh, Professor Hussein's point that um, because our political system uh, does not deliver what it promises, right? So people go out to vote. They vote for policies that they want. They vote for policies that um, uh, the party or the uh, politician says they're going to implement. And then when they get in power and they have the chance to do it, they don't do it. That is devastating to politics. That is devastating to democracy. So what they do is they turn to this identitarian politics and they say, OK, I'm going to vote with my team. I'm going to vote with the person I like that's likable, that's most like me, that I'd like to have a beer with. How did that turn out in the 2000 election between George Bush and uh, Al Gore? Don't do that. OK, I'm being a little pedantic, but uh, really, people, we can't afford to do this. You've got to look at the issues and don't get your information from campaign ads. Don't look at campaign ads. Do your own research. Know how these like with COVID. Do your own research. Like no, not like with COVID. <laughs> Do it on Facebook. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Research on Facebook. <laughs> no, but look at look at the history of these politicians. I mean, if you just look, have a cursory glance at Bernie Sanders uh, history as a politician, you know that this guy is solid. You know that this guy stands for and will implement if he gets the chance, the things that he says he believes in because he does believe in them. And I think that's true of Nina Turner as well. So do a little bit of homework, for God's sake. Don't listen to campaign ads and to mailers that you get. Uh, just don't do that. That's not reliable information, please. The second point I would make would be that I think the, big, the biggest determinant here is money. Now we can say, well, if we have the issues and we're saying the right things and we're connecting to people, that it's going to turn out for the best. I would say most of the time it doesn't. And money is the biggest reason. Nina Turner was outspent two to one when you look at all of the expenditures that were made. And that is very effective at lowering turnout. That's was the she biggest... really outspent two to one? Yeah, I, I mean, didn't I know. I thought Nina had raised a lot of money. She did. But, uh, million. I think he's including dark money, dark oh, money okay. and, and the packs. I mean, they dumped, I think, two and a half million dollars uh, into uh, Brown's campaign at the last in, in the last fracking couple of weeks. Lady. The fracking. Uh, lady. Yeah. And, and a lot of this money was coming from Republicans and Republican supporters. So, you know, I, the money does have a big effect, unfortunately. And the third point is the stupidity that uh, Professor Faluna uh, uh, raised. You know, again, don't vote on things like that. Don't vote on whether or not you like Nina Turner's glasses. Let okay. me push back on that. All right. All right. If uh, Nina Turner got, what, 36,000 votes? The people who vote, who show up, who are registered, are they stupid? I, I would assume the people who stay home are stupid and ill-informed. I would assume of the 100,000 people who voted in Ohio 11 on Tuesday, are they uh, low information voters? I, I think it's, it's quite possible that many of them are. And for this reason, the people that turn out to vote in primaries um, I think they fall into two different groups. So one are, uh, are the people who do know a lot, who do look into these, to, into the issues, who do vote on ideology. Uh, and then there are others who vote because they, they think it's their obligation. And, but they're not, they don't know enough to vote on the issue. They just vote because they feel that they are obligated as citizens to vote, but they don't so, necessarily inform themselves. Let me, let me, let me and then I'll go to Ian Faluna in, in a second. Uh, we're all low information voters. And this is why I think our side needs to examine our tone and the way we sell the issues. When I was a kid, my parents would get a mailer from Ralph Nader because my parents worked. They didn't have time. And Ralph Nader would send a ballot that was filled out for them and they would go and vote because Ralph Nader is God, in, at least in democracy. Uh, my parents would not consider themselves low information voters. They because we live in a republic and you can't follow everything. You depend on Congress people and persuaders, people you trust. We trusted. I still trust Ralph Nader. I trust Howie Klein. These are persuadable, well-informed people. So when you have people who think it's their democratic responsibility to show up and vote, even though they're not following it the way some of us are, they're depending on a persuader, an influencer. Right. And I, me, and I think our side, I'm talking about 
the left, the Bernie supporters, the Nina Turner supporters have not learned. I, uh, Professor Marianne Cummings is on the ground persuading, and I think she can attest this. We sit in the security of our ideological bunker and throw bombs and we don't know where they land and we fight among ourselves and we're not persuading. We're not persuading anybody. We don't have a Ralph Nader filling out who we trust to tell us who to vote for. I don't care how deeply you follow politics. You're still a low information voter. You can't do your own research. You really need to trust somebody to tell you how to vote. I, I, I support Nina Turner because of Marianne Cummings and because of Howie Klein and the people in, our, in this community who, who, who have studied it. They're very persuasive people in our community. Right. But, but for every one Ralph Nader, and there's only one, uh, there are, you know, a hundred other people who are out there persuading people who are saying, oh, you can trust me. But they are not trustworthy. So, exactly. And, and Ralph Nader is really, I think, an exception. I mean, he is a man of integrity. And Bernie, there's Bernie. And, yeah. Now it gets harder, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, after that, it gets a little bit more difficult. Even, even um, Glenn Greenwald now is questionable. Who? Glenn Greenwald. Even now, I, you know, I. Yeah, I mean, you could. You, right. I, I looked to him, uh, but then he started. You know, people change. So oh. I don't know what's motivating that change. Uh, it doesn't matter. You, you really do have to look at the individual candidates and say, and, and look at their history, you know, the way they've actually voted, the things that the, those issues that they've stood by for years and years and say, uh, do I agree with those positions, with those policies, rather than saying, Oh, you know, this guy's trustworthy because, look, he has kids. He's got a family. He's like me. He smiles. You know, this is not a good way to, to make the decision. Um, I, I think, the you know, it should be made easier. Right. So my argument would be in a, if, if we could redo our political system, I would have a strong party model uh, uh, political system. That is where you have parties that clearly stand for things. You give people clear choices. You don't have the just two parties where everyone is pushed into one or the other. And, you know, when a party is elected, that they carry out the platform that they uh, were elected on. That's how you avoid a lot of this mistrust, the uh, political alienation, the low voter turnout. There are a lot of issues, unfortunately, that are contributing to this. And it's, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, Nina, Nina Turner didn't do this or she didn't do that. I mean, yeah, I, it, I understand we have to play with the cards we're given. But at the same time, we should be aware that we're dealing with a very poor hand. Now, the, 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 we should probably change the subject. Uh, is Brown that bad? She looks pretty bad to me. <laughs> she is a Democrat. Yeah. She looks like she's going to be, she'll do what she's told to do. Who's, yeah, I guess it depends on who's telling her what. Marianne, is is Brown that bad? Well, this is this is kind of this is sort of the um, Colin Powell syndrome, right? Colin Powell, basically unindicted co-conspirator in the Rand Contra, covered up my life. He's a made man. He's proved that he will do what it takes in the service of power. What Chantel Brown did at uh, on city council just showed to the people. You know, who are in the power structure of the Democratic Party is that she'll do what she's told. 
She won't. In other words, and then they have something on her too. So we need people. If she, if she strays too far out of line. So this is. But we do need people who do what they're told. Huh? We do need people. Uh, you know, Professor Adnan Hussein is a petty tyrant. He's yes, and as, a, as as would be I if I were a suzerain of this country. Yeah, I mean, you know, running. You do need. Uh, okay. Uh, but she's a, she's supposed to be representing her district. And, you know, there was a little bit of a clashy clash when we were first elected you know, our board of commissioners here because that for the park district, because they had previously been appointed by, uh, by by the county boards. So they had their flunkies there. And, you know, I have to gently remind my executive director of the park district that I'm not employed by the park district. I'm not really technically park district. I'm the representative of the people who live here. But, you know, somebody like Chantel Brown, she's dirty enough and, uh, you know, checks all the other boxes, you know, female check, you know, a person of color check, uh, is willing to, uh, you know, play by the corrupt machine check, check, check. They love her. She's the person that's going to get along with the Washington culture. Well, David Brooks in The New York Times says okay. the Biden approach is working. So there's uh, let's uh, Professor Ian Faluna is an atmospheric teaches atmospheric science. I understand my daughter had a wonderful hike with you. Yes, she was very well behaved. Good. You'd be very proud. Yes, she's uh, amazing. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so we've had some good news. Uh, is is it Greenland or the, the ice sheet, the glacier? Where did the, the the glacier completely melted or something? Is that is that a good thing or a bad thing? I always forget. Uh, it's probably not great. Oh, well, glaciers melting is bad. Yeah, because the land ice goes into the ocean and makes the ocean deeper than it was before. Oh, that's bad. That's generally the bad part. OK. Um, yeah. So, well, the, just the last thing I wanted to say about uh, about elections in my own experience, going door to door and trying to, um, you know, unseat Pelosi and Feinstein, <laughs> which maybe that's a futile task, but it, it, the most immovable emotion I've encountered in people is this idea that I think they get from the media that is that we need those people who have accrued the power in the system because they're much more valuable than some new upstart who might have a great, you know, spiel and might be a great speaker and all that, but they're going to come in as powerless folk. This idea that these these, you know, freshman con Congress people are going to be completely powerless. And, you know, I never was able to really argue against that. I was never able to move anyone off of that position, which seems really, really intransigent. So that's I just wanted to throw that out. I, I don't know. That's very helpful. I hate to get old Joseph Campbell on you. And this is for another conversation uh, about mythology. I was reading a little American history over the weekend and th there are strains that go all the way back to you know Jonathan Edwards and and the Pilgrims and the Puritans about freedom and land and the American this mythology that includes free labor. I mean, baked into this system is cheap labor, either from indentured servants or slaves. I mean. And I, this is for another conversation. I just wonder if if it's part mythology and part American, if there's something baked into the American character, if my, you know, my grandparents came from Eastern Europe. Uh, when they get here, do they change? Do people change? Is there something? I don't know. It's a it's a stupid. Uh, I'm tired. Uh, let's talk about the environment. Okay, just I mean, quickly, the thing I had wanted to just uh, interject was about the the fires in in the Western U.S. and and Canada. I know we've talked about this a lot, but um, there was a there was a, a satellite study that looked at these you know these speaking of Hiroshima tomorrow, um, 
that mushroom cloud, which is typically described as a mushroom cloud, is actually uh, a form of what we call now pyrocumulonimbus, which is like a big, huge thunderstorm, but it's fueled mostly by the heat released from forest fires. Mm. So they had this um, satellite study of of it's literally climate change It is literally it's creating its own climate, and particularly in Canada. I mean, the amount of cumulonimbi or pyrocumulonimbi in Canada was through the roof. And the thing about these clouds that I just wanted to point out um, is that they come up with a bunch of ash. Right. So they pump a bunch of ash up there. Those particles rub together and create the static elect- electric charge necessary to produce light. And also because there's a lot of those particles, it tends to um, not produce as much rain. It makes smaller liquid droplets, which are less favorable for making rain. This is a a principle that's been known for a long time called polluvial constipation, which is something I always love to talk about in class, where you if you put more particles like from an exhaust or from an industrial process into a cloud, it's less likely to rain and it actually lasts longer. Polluvial constipation? Polluvial. Polluvial constipation. Constipation. Is where you can actually. Opiate addiction. Is it from opiate addiction? (laughs) It's from wildfire addiction. (laughs) Polluvial constipation. It's the opposite of cloud seeding. It's actually the, like, in in a sense, you can think about it. So, but the point I wanted to make was that so these clouds are very deep, very big. Typically in nature, those would be huge thunderstorms that produce a lot of rain, but they don't produce a lot of rain, but they do produce a lot of lightning. And so the number of counts um, that they, they said in, in Western Canada, they were seeing pyrocumulonimbus occur almost daily now. And um, this is only by the, by the end of July when this report came out. Um, and that's halfway through the fire season. And lightning so, puts out fires or creates fires? Uh, that would be creating fires, yeah. Oh, so it makes it worse. Exactly. They kind of spawn mm. their own. It's like a positive feedback. So there was just a really impressive study that came out uh, up through, like I said, at the end of July that showed on this one day in June, there were 113,000 cloud to ground lightning strikes during this one day, which they said is larger than they've ever seen. It accounts for approximately 5% of Canada's entire annual lightning count in this one day in the middle of summer. So, um, so that's, I just wanted to bring that up. You know, Northern California, the coast has been very, very foggy, inundated by fog this summer, been very cool along the coast, but the interior of California is still baking like the rest of a lot of the Western U.S. US. And uh, there, there was a fire in what Greenville up there in in um, the northern Sierras. It just it just consumed the entire town and burnt it to crisp. Now, I think there weren't that many casualties, but um, there's still some serious fires producing a lot of smoke uh, up north. Um, so and like like I said, it's only about halfway through the fire season. So I'm just uh, keeping my eye on that. And I just wanted to at least interject a little bit about cloud physics there. Well, and we learned polluvial constipation. Exactly. It's a great party term. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hussein. Yeah, I just had a question for Ian about this and also about the Gulf Stream. But first about this. Um, uh, I guess I was wondering why there has been so much haze here in eastern Canada because of the wildfires. Whereas last week when I was in uh, Connecticut, just a few hours south, about five hours or so south, Mm. um, well, south and and east, I didn't notice these same kinds of effects. And it sounds like what you're describing is that there are some very local effects that are different, that the way the fires affect the larger environment is somewhat different depending on on the location and i'm wondering if it is the wind patterns that are making 
uh, a lot of the um, stuff in the air from the smoke and debris and so on stay up further north. Um, well, were you were you in Connecticut during that that rain period? Was it last week when it was very rainy on the East Coast? There was a well, giant. Was just, I think it was just after the major rain, but it was still quite rainy. Um, you know. Yeah. So I think there was. a So that system generally is going to bring air up from the south. So, you know, yeah, it's shifts in those patterns will make regions further into Canada, maybe more smoky and then clear out certain regions. I think that was just a temporary sort of storm system that moved through that might have affected your perception of that. OK, yeah. Now, as far as I know, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you asking this, I was thinking about it. If there are so many fires, can that actually regionally affect the temperature and the dynamics of the atmosphere? And as far as I know, no one's really looked at that. It's it's kind of believed that it's more of a smaller scale effect, like a giant pyrocumulus, not a continental scale effect. But that's an interesting question that I'd be I'm going to keep my eyes out for people who look at whether or not a really bad fire season can actually alter the thermodynamics of the of the continent. I don't think so. I don't think there's enough energy there, but. But clearly, but clearly, I was just reading in The Guardian today, clearly um, the consequences of global warming are affecting the Gulf Stream, which will have huge effects on weather um, if it if it changes um, and yeah. doesn't continue to go. And I think the um, analysis was that melting of the Greenland ice sheet and putting yeah. so much fresh water. Yep into um you know into the ocean that it's changing the salinity and some of this current and flow has to do with the salinity maybe you could yes just just more. briefly so there's a there's a really important feature of the ocean in the north atlantic where it creates deep water where the ocean up there in the north atlantic gets so dense that it falls below because it's more dense than its surroundings. And so it falls, it's convection, but it's upside down, it's falling deep. So you have this deep convection in the ocean and that helps pull on the Gulf Stream, pulling that warm tropical water up along the Eastern seaboard. Um, so yeah, those two are connected. And so one of the ways that you make coal, you make really dense water, you evaporate fresh water, making it saltier and you cool the water, which makes it more dense. But now if you have an influx of fresh water, you, you eliminate that, making it saltier part. And so it's less it's less dense. You're making sea, surface seawater that's less dense and therefore you're resisting that production of that deep convection, that falling of this dense cold water. So that's exactly and this has been talked about, man, for 20 years, they've been talking about the shutdown of the what's called the thermohaline circulation, which is this very deep global circuit of ocean water that circulates on hundreds of years time scales. Um, and they've posited, I'm not sure what the current idea is exactly about that, but if it does shut down, what that means is you stop bringing that warm water north. And so what might happen in the short term is you might get Europe becoming very, very cold, much colder because you, you stopped that heat transport mechanism. So the idea was everyone's going to be saying, what global warming, but it's snowing in, in London kind of thing. Right. But it's one of these sort of spatial inhomogeneities that's that's part of all the variability going on. So but I understood also that um, for other continents, it would introduce disastrous uh, weather that would affect agriculture really absolutely in Africa, Latin America. Absolutely. Just like the El Nino and La Nina I've talked about a bunch of times on here is this big patch of cold or warmer water in the equatorial Pacific. If you do the same thing in the North Atlantic, change that surface temperature a lot, you're going to alter weather all over the globe. Absolutely. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's unnerving. I haven't looked into what they were saying. They, they had measured like the lowest currents in the Gulf Stream somewhere in a while, but I, I haven't really looked into the exact quantity. That it was like the, the lowest current in the Gulf Stream for 1600 years. I mean, I don't know exactly how they would measure that, but um, that was the that was the claim. Yeah. Professor Marianne. Professor Ann, are, do you have a feeling that uh, the Biden administration has a connection with you and your colleagues. I mean, is there anybody in your field that is 
giving this in, briefing regularly this information to uh, you hear the name Gavin Schmidt a lot and, and apparently he's on a, a, a some sort of uh, board that has a presence he's a NASA he's a NASA head right now and so okay. he's present and I believe his voice is being heard um, and he's often interviewed in paper so you see him commenting on these kinds of reports coming out so what is Carrie doing I mean Carrie is our yeah. climate czar I don't know. I don't know. What is, what is Al Gore doing? <laughs> Making what a lot is of money. Ching, ching. <laughs> but you know, I think our European. I mean, Turkey's also a blaze. Like the wildfires in Turkey's are out of control. Uh, the heat waves in southern Greece or uh, western Greece have been really intense. So I think there might be some more sort of. Uh, visibility of this because of the, the European impact, which is a sh which is a pity, right? We talked about this before. The biggest impacts are likely to happen in the global south, which is way underreported in the, in the press, right? So you know, you know, in some ways, it's better that it snows in London to freak people out. In some way, it gets a bigger headline or something. But anyways, I don't know what Carrie's doing. I have, I, I, I don't read his email, his newsletter. There's horrible flooding in London. Uh, Brian May, the famous astrophysicist who uh, played backup for Freddie Mercury, is warning about uh, too many basements in London. People are building too many basements and it's causing sewage to flow into the Thames. I, didn't, I forgot that Brian May was an astrophysicist. Yeah, right. He's one of the famous rock and roll science people like uh, Brian Cox. Was in a one hit wonder band in the 80s in the UK and then became a famous Who's scientist. Brian Cox. You know, he's a he's a spokesperson that's always on the uh, TV shows about ah, science is wonderful. Woo. OK, you know, fancies Professor himself Vick? a Carl Sagan Jr. kind of thing guy, but. Professor Bick, what rock band are you playing with these days? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, David. Um, I I wanted to uh, to recommend an article um, in the New Yorker by uh, Jane Mayer. Uh, she she published this uh, three days ago. It's called "The Big Money Behind the Big Lie." And uh, the uh, subheading is Donald Trump's attack on democracy are being promoted by rich and powerful conservative groups that are determined to win at all costs. And she goes into the audit that's uh, currently being conducted in uh, a county in uh, Arizona. And she goes into the funding for that and all the problems with it. And... Uh, also, she goes into the general attack on the electoral process in the country by these same groups. I'll just quickly read you a couple of quotes that are from the article. Uh, Richard Hassan, uh, a law professor at the University of California, Irvine, and one of the country's foremost election law experts, told her, quote, I'm scared shitless. Referring to the array of new laws passed by Republican state legislatures since the 2020 election, he said, it's not just about voter suppression. What I'm really worried about is election subversion. Election officials are being put in place who will mess with the count. So, you know, they're putting people in, in what should be um, nonpartisan positions, right, uh, that oversee elections who are hyperpartisan and will do whatever they can, can to get the outcome that they want for their party. This is very dangerous stuff. Uh, Arizona Secretary of State. Katie Hobbs, whose office has the authority over the administration of elections, said the conspiracy driven audit, referring to the one in Arizona, looks so comical you have to laugh at it sometimes, but it's dangerous. It's feeding the kind of misinformation that led to the January 6th insurrection. She added, I've gotten death threats 
I've had armed protesters outside my house. Every day there was a total barrage of social media to our office. We've had to route our phones to voicemail so that no one has to listen to them. It has been really traumatizing. As I said, if they can storm the Capitol, they can certainly go after an election official in Arizona or Georgia. Yes, uh, the, the level of intimidation that that's being, you know, exercised here is, is very concerning. And so I, I recommend that article. She goes into uh, depth about all the, um, you know, conservative organizations such as the Heritage Foundation that are fueling uh, the and the and Alec, the American legislative and the Federalist Society, by the way, which is coming up with a legitimate argument, you know, uh, uh, the argument that Trump was giving that seemed addled about how Mike Pence can reject the electoral votes, there is there are people within the Federalist Society who are coming up with a well-varnished argument, not something from Giuliani. This is, you know, something that's articulate, you know, uh, Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, Federalist Society, states' rights, uh our our founding fathers thought that you should consult the people but it's really the state legislatures that should pick the president that whole thing the they're and they're coming up with a legitimate argument that will have a nice shiny intellectual veneer for 2022 not something clumsy like trump and january 6 they're lining up the great legal minds to to pack some quote unquote intellectual undergirding now to this uh, coup. Well, we we all learned twenty years ago, more than twenty years ago, that there are several steps between the election in November and a president actually getting sworn in. All of them highly non democratic, and it's you know like. The electors could be pushed at the last minute to switch their votes. They're not bound by any votes. I mean, there were curiosities when some electors in some states decided to, like, vote for Colin Powell rather than Trump and, you know, like Bernie rather than Hillary. But, you know, they didn't matter. That doesn't mean that they couldn't matter. The fact that it was always looked at as sort of curiosities. And they probably mostly have been for you know, most of our uh, history, but, uh, Ooh, yeah. I mean, be, every single one of those steps, but you get some people with a focus. The, yeah, uh, the video of Marjorie Taylor green going after David Hogg, uh, if she would do that in public Parkland survivor, uh, would oh, you be no, oh, okay, okay. now? Now I know who I, yeah, I, I, a I, kid. I remember a, that kid. Right. kid. I mean, he's, um, he's going to Harvard. He's a little too opportunistic in the he's coming up with his own pillow to take on. I mean, I'm a big David. Ha I'm an Emma. I'm team Emma Gonzalez, not David Hogg. But uh, still, you know, to go after uh, a, a survivor of Parkland uh, and what? Hey, well, that was, you know, the uh, what was it the Lincoln Project guy? I mean, he was a big Sandy Hook denier. I mean, these guys are, you know, kind of, yeah, they're vile. But they're vile. They I mean, would you be an election official in Georgia knowing that you'd get doxxed? If you, you know, people, you want these people coming to your homes? It's easy to sit it out. I'm going to sit this one out. I got, you know, I don't need this headache. And then who, who's going to take those jobs? Oh, look, you know, in some sense, that horse has left the barn. I mean, does anyone forgot the 2020 election, even the 2012 election where um, Karl Rove did not get the memo <laughs> that the FBI was actually in the secretary of state's office in Ohio because the secretary of state a week before said, oh, we're just going to change the election. It, it's not the counting software on these machines. It's the tabulation software whatever that meant 
And so people like Gene Fitzgrackets and, you know, other voter integrity, uh, election integrity groups had a uh, got a emergency injunction from uh, the circuit court in Cincinnati that, uh, you know, basically said, hey, you can't do this. And the FBI was all over. <laughs> so meanwhile, Carl Rove is waiting for those numbers that he was told were going to come out of Cuyahoga County. And even, uh, you know. Megan, Megan Kelly was saying, really, well, are those real numbers or are all just made up Republican numbers? But, you know, this kind of chicanery is going on it, it, all the time. And it's amazingly not opposed by the Democratic Party leadership. It, it, they just they just turned a blind eye to it, maybe because it helps them keep potential Nina Turner's you know, from getting the nomination, I don't know, but it, they, there is a curious uh, disinterest from the Democratic Party leadership in any of these things, which should be, you know, sending off like five along fire bells in, in, you know, in terms of do we, are we really in a democracy? Yeah, uh, I want to go to Professor Ann Lee in a second. There's a great story in Rolling Stone, John Kerry in 2000 and five was approached at a party by Bobby Kennedy, who wasn't Bobby Kennedy Jr. He wasn't an anti-vaxxer. He hadn't gone crazy yet. And he had incontrovertible proof that Kerry lost the popular vote, but won the Electoral College in 2004. Mm -hmm. He won Ohio and he walked up to Kerry at a party six months later. He says, why don't you want to see? I have proof that you won Ohio. And Kerry went, uh huh. Uh huh, and walked away because uh, it was the same thing in '60 when people walked up to Nixon and said, "We have proof that Chicago was stolen," and he went, "Uh huh," because he knew about Northern Illinois that was being stolen for him and carry the dealing machine. Well, but Nixon, there were people in northern Illinois. Oh, there were, oh you see, there are other people in northern. <laughs> stealing for Nixon and Kerry was going, uh-huh. You know, I can produce, I'll tell you who stole it for me. They stole the election better than I did. Uh, which, you know, this is how you end up with Andrew Cuomo. I have to believe that, you know, he's our Democrat and he knows how to win and if I have to believe that he knows how to uh, let's I'm not going to say steal an election, but win an election, get the votes that, uh, you know, some friends know. Professor Lee, what is on yeah. your mind? Oh, it uh, um, I, I actually qu am quite amused by the degree of grifting that uh, uh previous guy is his coming up with uh he, he was just fronting new uh membership cards to to uh to grift to his uh, uh followers trump, trump yeah card. trump a trump card a membership card of course he couldn't correct the damn spelling on one of them but you know that's just sort of par for the course. Did it spell Trump properly? Did he have the? Well, F no, I spelled <laughs> official wrong. But it was just, it you know, and and he loves those eagles that look unfortunately like German eagles, and it's just uh, that was uh, that's today's latest craziness that uh, you too can become a card carrying member of, of the Trumpist whatever elite. Um, and and then the other thing is that uh, there's just more proof of the uh, of uh, uh, Jeff Clark, the uh, what is it, deputy attorney general who essentially tried to overthrow the government. And yeah. I, I'm waiting to see all that. that I, once we see the receipts, it's just going to get ugly. This is Donald Trump telling the Justice Department I'll take care of the rest. You just say there was fraud. Yep. And and they're saying this is worse than Watergate. How bad is it? I mean, I'm so shock proof now and I'm thinking, well, yeah, I mean, of course, Trump said that to the Justice Department. Like, of course, he would say that. So is that 
criminal? Is it impeachable? I mean, it's coming out this week. But, you know, if somebody if Biden or George W. Bush said it, we'd be up in arms. But how bad is that? Well, I mean, the modus is that uh, Trump says all kinds of crap. And we know this from all of those biographies. But the reality, and I think the reality we'll see in a, probably a couple more books that are coming out, uh, you know, is that there are real receipts for this. This Clark thing, all the memos were in place. So some there's got to be a much deeper trail to sort of generate all of that, those sort of administrative things. Uh and, and I, I think once once we see that narrative come more into place, because I think some of the more recent books have started to show what the timeline has been, just like I was mentioning before, that the, you know, the, the New York Times visualization of the insurrection <clears throat> actually it provides a, a reasonable explanation for why it got so terrible and why we have now uh, we're up to four suicides for uh Capitol Police officers. Two this week. Yeah. I think it's six, actually. I think. Oh, I think we're at four, yeah, but two. I who knows? Whatever. A, 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 a last month CBS did a poll of Trump voters, uh, and a narrow majority of Trump supporters described January 6th as an example of patriotism and defending freedom. He is the uh, the biggest fundraiser still. He has a, a hundred million dollar war chest. Uh, he has a hundred million dollars in cash. Nobody has more cash. Tim Scott out of South Carolina is, comes in second. He's got uh, seven million in cash. He's not going away. And... Uh, well, why stop the grift now? I mean, it's proved quite lucrative. He's, uh, you know, no longer is he in the business of fake buildings and branding steaks and bottled water, but he's now branded our politics and is able to exploit it quite effectively, I think. Why would he end the campaign now? This is really the only gig he's got going i think maybe but, he'll be a perpetual yeah. candidate you know forever am i wrong when i say we don't need to pass a patriot act i was against the patriot act just enforce the laws that are already on the books you, you just mobilize the fbi homeland security and the justice department and just enforce the laws that are on the books. Why is it so hard to lock these people up, to get them? Just, uh, I don't understand why Merrick Garland isn't picking them off one by one and locking them up. It's going to be politicized. Because there's as much dirt on their side. And then and once you start pulling that thread, man, the sweaters crumbles. And, and if you just and if you just attack Republicans, it looks completely partisan, delegitimizes it. Right. So I think that's why. And I think there's a little bit of a problem with Trump because his gross transgressions are just a little bit too much like business as usual. It's why they had to shut down the second trial of uh, Manafort's second trial. Because that was the trial for the underlying crime, and the uh, and Talking Points memo got a list, got a leak of a list of the. Uh, of, of Refresh the, my memory the, on Manafort, please. Oh yeah, I, I think he was like Trump's campaign manager for oh, about a the long second time. trial was money laundering. The yeah, well, the second trial, the the first trial was on um, you know kind of the lying. Uh, well. Well, there was an obstruction of justice, and I think, the, and the tax evasion. But the second trial was on the violation of the actual FARA laws, which that was the one that was going to be in D.C. And 
the witness list was just a who's who of all the very prominent uh, lobbyists in Washington. I mean, it's like amazing how much Manafort, you know, just kind of circulated in that crowd. And, you know, it's, it's actually kind of amazing that Tony Podesta didn't go down with him because Tony Podesta was blatantly violating Fair of laws. He's is back. He, is he back? I thought he laid low. Well, he did lay yeah, low. He closed up shop and he's reopened it because uh, he can lobby uh, the Biden administration. Of course. And, and you know, he's now uh, got a few more bullet points on his resume, made man resume. So, uh, you know, it, so it, it, and, uh, you, you just mentioned before, you know, why not law enforcement? Well, you know, the FBI has been a problematic institution since it's founded. And I, I don't even pretend to know how we would go about reforming that. Well, certainly certain things we can reform, like we can get out the whole immigration thing, move that out of, you know, terrorism, national security. I mean, ICE really should be dismantled. It's just, you know, the Trump policies are still going on. Separations are still going on. We're, we're doing a lot of those on the other side of the border. But these facilities are the same. They're the same people. There has just been a slew of articles out about how they were hiring like non-professional uh, people to be uh, handling the children that are in these facilities. I mean, it's just that we, that we these are refugees. A lot of these people, we're violating international law by sending them away. I mean, we should be handling this in civil courts, in with, you know, under you know, not the national security state. It's, yeah. Well, before we, before we uh, wrap this up, Professor Adnan Hussein, uh, without violating any privacy, uh, this show is a marathon. I, I don't want to delve into your personal life. It's none of my business, but uh, there, did you run a marathon? No, definitely not. I, I, I ran did the you do what I told you to do. I ran the equivalent of, um, oh, I don't know, what's a good example of a podcast <laughs> that's short. Um, uh, my family ran an eight-mile road race, and I wimped out and ran the 5K fun run, which I finished, <laughs> but that's not a big achievement. But, you know, so, but then I did play soccer, basketball, kickball, uh, tennis, uh, and uh, ultimate frisbee and wiffle ball in the subsequent hours. So you do realize this was in Connecticut, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is like a bad Nancy Myers movie <laughs> where, where you're being tested. You have to go to this. I would assume it's Connecticut. It's rustic and beautiful. And they're just making you <laughs> do all yeah. these things. All I wanted to do was enjoy the scenery, but I was forced uh, to uh, play sports which i enjoy but uh, it was exhausting but uh, more beautiful. importantly i got into the classic arguments with family members over politics so that was you know fun and enjoyable uh and it was not with the trump supporting faction that i had the most kind of uh, great upsurge of, of reaction, um, but it was with a neoliberal kind of very uh, liberal on social issues, but uh, remarkably conservative when it comes to, you know, monetary issues, taxation, all the key core things about government spending and so on who was just telling me about how horribly progressive, too progressive for him. Um, Seattle is. And I discovered very quickly, I said, oh, yeah, it's very progressive in some respects. You've got $15, you know, you know, minimum wage passed years ago. And he was like, oh, that's just, you know, terrible. And, um, you know, the other housing tax that they tried to impose upon major corporations, this was an outrage as well. And so it came out that uh, this relative uh, was, um, 
you know, funding the Kashama Sawant, you know, was had at least donated to the Kashama Sawant recall oh, uh, oh. effort, uh, which I found very funny because uh, he makes an awful lot more money than than me. But I had spent twice as much as him uh, in support of her. So I said, you're you're, you're going to have to up your game. Um, but in any case, uh it was interesting that I got along better with the Trump supporters simply because we could sort of shelve. We're just on different sides of things. We understand that we're not expecting to agree, but we might find common ground on certain things and you can leave it at that. But with people who are closer, supposedly ideologically found an incredible rigidity, you know, unwillingness to accept any, um, so-called, you know, fact-based analysis. So supposedly they believe in science and facts, but when you share a few of them that undermine the house of cards upon which they're resting their identity, they're very upset uh, uh, about that. So in any case, it was an interesting, uh, an interesting experience that I think was a microcosm of the larger scale politics we've just been discussing. Yeah. You know, I, again, I'm a broken record on this. Uh, I believe in an inquisition. Uh, it, instead of arguing, just keep asking why. why. Why do you believe that? That's interesting. Why? And 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 eventually they punch you. Yes. Well, <laughs> we got close to that, I think, yeah. you know, at, at certain stages. But um, it, to me, it's it's fascinating. Once you accept the fact that you're never going to convince them, nobody ever backs down. All you can do is hope they don't show up on Election Day. It's the only way to win this thing. Well, they seem to recognize that on the Republican side. Just suppress the vote. Why make yes. the argument? Let's just undermine their you know, willingness to come out, uh, their faith in the system. And that seems to be, um, you know, what's happening. I guess the one issue that I wanted to bring up, however, was that I was shocked since this was one of the first times. I, well, this is the first time I'd crossed the border since December into the U.S. Legally. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, and how much did you, how many balloons did you swallow this time? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we, we from did smuggle some, some Canadian squash. Uh, they do ask you, oh, do you have any, you know, fruit and vegetables and all of that? And we were bringing some from the garden. So we did have to deceive the border guards. I guess I shouldn't say that on you know, oh public God. airwaves like this. But um, but what, one issue that I, I noticed was that nobody was masking except in uh, the sort of really wealthy you know, kind of Connecticut towns and then some of the downtown stores. But across my journey through upstate New York into rural Connecticut, um, people were not masking indoors. It was kind of shocking to me as the virus, you know, mutates and rages uh, that people were acting as if uh, we should all be back to normal. And there was this confidence in being double vaccinated um, that really misunderstood what the whole point of the masking was and what the limitations of vaccination are. Um, you know, it's you can still spread the virus, you know, even if you won't suffer any ill effects as somebody who's double vaccinated. And the purpose of wearing a mask is to, you know, uh, protect others as much, if not more than oneself. So. I found it very strange to be one of the only people indoors wearing a mask. It really marked me out. Um, and I think it marked me out in this kind of cultural way as either a paranoid uh, a hypochondriac or as somebody who, uh, you know, refused to be free. So I, I kept running in my mind that, you know, Rousseau talks about how people have to be forced to be free. It's a very interesting kind of contradiction of his political philosophy and the social contract. And I kept thinking people around me wanted to force me to be free, you know, because this was, uh, you know, a real a real marker of dis mark of distinction, you know, in caring about that. And it reminds me this whole issue about freedom. And since the Trump uh, supporters think of January 6th as defending uh, freedom um, is how many of these conflicts are now emerging around the 
you know, policy, uh, COVID policy during the height of the uh, emergency pandemic, people were uh, accepting some of these restrictions for public health, these various measures. There was a lot of uh, resistance in some quarters to it, but now I notice that um, attempting to enforce public health now seems to be very risky for politicians. So in Germany, the minister who wanted to put in various kinds of restrictions on going out in public, um, you know, especially for things that are considered not necessities of life, but if you want to attend a sports event or eat in an indoor, you know, restaurant and, and so on, that you should, you know, be masked. This was, um, or that you have to demonstrate that you've been vaccinated. Uh, there's an awful lot of resistance. Even coalition partners have, um, you know, questioned, questioned it's this. It's the authoritarian Marine Le Pen's party in France. Yeah. They're yeah. anti-vaxxers and she's a racist. What, what is that? What, the, you, yeah. if, you're, if you're a racist, you're an anti-vaxxer. For the most well, and it's also sim interestingly similar, like in, in Australia, they have restrictions. You're not allowed to leave the country, which is quite amazing, right? If you think about what was the common way of describing how awful the totalitarian, you know, kind of Warsaw Pact, Iron Curtain countries were, it's like you could not leave. You were not free to leave the country. And, right? and they have people in India who are stranded in India who can't come back to Australia. Yeah, so yeah, what right. does that say? Then what does that mean? Well, I don't know. This is a really interesting problem is that we, we do have, um, I think, a lack of uh, faith in government and state power and authority being wielded for the common benefit. We don't seem to have a sense or confidence in the idea of the public anymore. That has been eroded by neoliberalism, corporate capitalism, the sclerotic character of our politics that we'd already been talking about, how it's not responsive to actual desires of the people in terms of enacting policies that benefit them on their behalf, but they're beholden entirely to corporate capitalist interests. And so it uh, it undermines, I think, uh, faith in, 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 in the public. And so wielding political you know power um even on behalf of public health will be looked at by many as authoritarian and suppressing of people's freedoms because we don't have that rousseauian sort of idea of the social compact functioning it is just you know the play of interest it's the uh, the factional nature of our politics so there are some people who are trying to impose their cultural proclivities upon the rest of us. This is how often it's looked at. But I have to say that I'm also very suspicious in some ways of the way in which um, state authorities and state powers like to use any opportunity to extend their powers in conditions of emergency. And then when the emergency is over, they either have to continue to promote that sense of emergency to maintain the same kind of structure of power and interests, or they extend it to other other areas because they've had the opportunity to do so and to work those out. And I find that creep um, you know, quite concerning. It just reminds me a little bit of um, you know, the kind of persecuting society of medieval Europe, how um, the idea of pollution and um, the, the metaphor of contagion and disease was so valuable and important for suppressing of minorities and of dissent. Um, you know, so I think we've got a real conundrum here about, you know, what is our, the nature of our politics going to be? So you're saying that there is some legitimacy to what DeSantis is saying? Well, uh, I think there's legitimacy to being concerned about the way in which the reflex of state authorities seems to be um, to whether they've thought about it fully and carefully. And, you know, is that their pr major priority is not protecting people's freedoms. It is making things easier for government to do what government does and to hold on to uh, power and that there is a fear of uh, of democracy and yet on the same don't you same see it as a binary i see it as a binary choice you either choose government or corporations at this point at this juncture in world history it's binary 
government or corporations? Unfortunately, the corporations have taken over the government. Exactly. But. That's, oh, the that's the problem. Which You're is always which. going to have governments. It's whether or not you have a say. I mean, if the government was going to disappear, you're not going to be left alone. <laughs> There's going to be powerful forces that come in. And, you know, like historically, they just take everything from you. Corporate. But, um, and the CDC, frankly, has not been uh, great on all things COVID. I mean, they, there's there's yeah. real reason to be kind of distrustful of them. I mean, why in the fuck would you originally say don't wear a mask? I don't care about the supply. I don't care about all that. And why, why don't you why don't you distribute vitamin D? There's a million reasons that they're not. Their message has not been public health. Uh, a hundred percent. Yes, and they've been muddying the waters too. I mean, exactly. it's either dangerous to go out in the crowd or it isn't. No, no, I, I'm going to stifle this oh. because I don't. I don't want to go after the CDC on this show. Okay. Everybody has, everybody has to get vaccinated. Fair enough. But you need well, to go to bed. Indeed. Well, I agree with you there. All I would say is that if you do care about public health, then what you do is you provide you know, PPP, you yes. give people right. the supports, you train more nurses and doctors and you, you know, pay for them to go co to college and get that training. You invest in ventilation systems in all the schools. You do those things because you care about the people, not, hey, let's, you know, impose various, you know, kinds of measures that uh, we're vague about. I mean, so that I think that's that's what we need is it isn't just state versus corporate. It's because because you have the corporate state uh, and it, you know, operates in very, you know, uh, antithetical ways to public interest. L let me uh, defend Fauci. He, he oh, said, don't do it. Don't 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 defend Fauci. Okay. You know, I'll tell you what. To defend Fauci. He said, you know, he said yesterday he's been transparent. He said we're not recommending booster shots yet even though you're going to be getting booster shots. But we're afraid that if we say get a booster shot, it will disabuse the 100 million people who haven't gotten the vaccination yet from getting the vaccine. They're going to they're going to hear it as, oh, the vaccine doesn't work. So he's been transparent in trying to move 100 million people to do the right thing. We're going to need booster shots. And uh, but, that the, the, but the WHO isn't there. They're recommending actually that the first world not take those extra shots while we spend time vaccinating the six and a half billion people who are unvaccinated that are just going to keep transmitting the damn vi virus. Like there's other we reasons. Are sending, we are sending to uh, Pfizer. I think we're sending what? Uh, two billion dollars worth of fight anyway i'm not going to defend <laughs> let, let, i i'm going to wrap it up hey uh wait one more thing I, I wanted to mention the lab leak no just kidding no, no, no. <laughs> Please. Please. i'm just trying to get you to go to bed david I That's know, I know. david can uh, i can i recommend a mutual fund yes please <laughs> <laughs> hey guys there really is a a very useful site i wanted to just make one mention of there is something called uh, helpweather.us. And what it is, is that it's a uh, Kinsa made these little thermometers, you know, that, that just millions and millions of people are using in clinics and at home. And they have GPS transmission. In other words, anybody, anytime somebody takes their temperature, they timestamp it and they have a location. They don't have any other information than that. And this helpweather.us basically plots this you know uses this temperature information as a predictor of whether or not there's going to be a, you know an outbreak of disease specifically covid and i've been following it for over a year it's been amazingly accurate really because it's the earliest even if somebody doesn't feel that they have symptoms the earliest symptom from covid is just an, an increase in temperature and for some people, that's all it is, and they don't even notice anything else. But that, that alone has just been an excellent uh, precursor for spikes in the COVID. So I, when I went over to uh, Ohio this, this past week, I did look on their map, and I saw that Summit County, which is where Akron is, uh, is like low. 
And I thought, okay, that's great. Uh, I'm looking down in Southern Illinois and all of a sudden it's like becoming blood red. The, the state itself is still moderate, but that's going to change. I mean, I mean, look at it, and it goes by, and it breaks down county by county. It's it's a really interesting site, and it's it's a kind of a clever idea. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I I have a simpler. I just call George Soros, and he tells <laughs> me where he's going to spread the virus this week. But uh, I know you guys don't have his phone number. Okay, Th uh, on a personal note, it's August. I'm honored uh, that everybody has shown up. Uh, in the Zoom room, I, uh, and uh, this is, I was talking, my, my daughter went on a hike. She was in uh, Northern California. Uh, she spent time with Dave and PA and uh, Sarah and Andy, and uh, we're doing office hours and hours uh, tomorrow, 24 hours of office hours. And this is the community has become I was talking to my daughter about this. It's become real. It, it, it uh, you know, Dave and P.A. and uh, Andy and Sarah. And uh, and at first it, it was I always say I felt like David Bowie and the man who fell to earth. I'm just looking at a hundred screens and you're kind of real, but you're not really real. You know, it's you're disembodied and uh this is real this is uh this has become something that i have nothing to do with especially office hours where i just kind of watch anyway uh it's been uh uh an interesting summer and uh we love dave and pa and andy and sarah and uh everybody so Thank Speaking you. Of office hours. Uh, can I just uh, announce that, um, you know, we're having the usual block of uh, the weekly uh, meetings. Uh, there's hammer and sickle uh, 12 to two. Then it's there's the idea. Like, why didn't anybody ever think of that before? It's just <laughs> brilliant. And from two to three weekly marks, we're reading Marx's Ecology, Materialism and Nature by John Foster Bellamy. And there's a new um, or a return of uh, a, a book club, but we're calling it the Feldman U. Lefty Book Union. <laughs> Every month we'll be reading a, a sort of popular, well-written book for a general audience. We're starting with Hadass Tears, A People's Guide to Capitalism. You only have a day's notice at this point, but take a look at it. She's also got some really good one minute videos on topics she covers in her book. So you can join that discussion from three to four office hours and hours on Saturday. Right. Please go to my website. There's a link right now. Just hit it. It says office hours and it'll take you right. You don't need a password. It'll take you right. And, and I pro you'll meet, you know, uh, we we've done a pretty good job weeding out the a holes, except me. Although I've pulled back, so we're even getting rid. Uh, you know, uh, it's I'll be there for the first hour and the last hour, and then look at the schedule. And I promise you will meet a uh, a wonderful group of people. Uh, it's uh, very special. So thank you all. I, I, it's uh, you know. It's been a long slog this summer, and uh, I, anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, I, David. Take care, y'all. Great to see you. you. Thank you.